Estate planning, probably one of the biggest issues our family ranches have to deal with and often avoided or done incorrectly in an effort to try to save money, thus creating bigger problems after mom and dad have passed. Normally speaking, probably the biggest issue is to figure out how to hand over the operation to the next generation. Attorney Dal Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma joins us today as we discuss topics like a trust versus a will. A trust that's revocable is just really a substitute for a will. But what that substitution does is really important. Also, we'll discuss the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust and practical information on LLCs, plus much more in our legal discussion today on estate planning. Yeah, you might be thinking this is a show mom and dad need to listen to, but if you ranch in any way, shape or size, no matter your age, I'd advise you to stay tuned to today's episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome back here again to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. Glad to have you with us on our program today. This is episode 115. And if you want to go back and listen on our podcast site, if you missed something here today, which uh, today's program has has a really a lot of great information, you can go to our podcast site at workingranchradio.com and you can download that show or you can share it out with somebody. If, they, if you find something valuable in there that you want to share out, you can do it from there as well. We'll get into that in just a moment, but I wanted to share with you kind of a, I guess, sort of a funny story. And it's kind of on myself. But if you've listened for some time, you know that I usually sign off the show with keep your head down and your mind in the middle. Well, uh, my nephew works for me and um, has worked for me for a couple of years. And the other day we were in discussion about that phrase and where that came from. And I said, well, that comes from if you're riding a bucking horse, you're supposed to keep your head down and your mind in the middle so that you stay on, right? Well, we were out checking cows the other day and uh, we've had a few early calves in the big bunch of cows and we wanted to get them tagged before they got much older because it doesn't get any easier the older they get. And so we found a cow and a calf that uh, we needed to get tagged and we're working kind of slow on them, but things sped up as they do when the calf's a week or so old. And so Tristan took a shot at the calf on the run there and he missed and so I thought well I'll kind of step in there and do the same thing and by that time we were moving at a pretty good pace so I went to throw a loop and about the time it shot out from there that old horse took a cheap shot with me and just went to bucking like you can't believe and I went over the left side of the horse landed in a, uh, a little bit of cactus that I found later on I had landed in a little bit of cactus took a roll and anyway Tristan come up and he said y'all right and I said yeah I'm fine so he went to get my horse and when we got everything all back together he he looked at me and he said, so tell me, which was it? Was your head not down or your mind not in the middle? So anyways, I thought I'd share the story for two reasons. It's just kind of funny. But the other side of it, too, is now, you know, if you've ever heard when I sign off on a show, keep your head down and your mind in the middle what that is referring to. But on a personal perspective, where that sort of stems from is when things in life start to get a little bit hairy, just remember, keep your head down and your mind in the middle, which for me this last week, wasn't wasn't really the case. Well, let's talk about what's on today's show. As you heard in the opening, we're going to be talking on estate issues and getting a legal perspective. As Dal Houston, who's an attorney with the firm of Benson and Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma, joins me. We've got a lot to talk about here today as we're going to get into really what he sees as ranching families, the big issues that he sees uh, people coming into his office about. Also, the differences between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust and their application for each of those uh, types of setups that uh, ranching families could be looking at. Also, how our LLCs work and why would they be used in our ranching situations? He has some concern on joint tenancy uh, setups as well. And just a lot of great discussion that I think you're going to find extremely useful on estate planning. And like I said in the opening, this isn't just a show for mom and dad or granddad and grandma. This is for all of us, no matter your size and scope of your operation or the age you are at. This is an issue that definitely is not better 
when you kick it down the road and try to handle it later on. So a great show lined up for you here today. And of course, later on in the program, meteorologist Don Day will be stepping in as we take a look at our long-term weather. And he's anticipating a little bit of weather change in hopes that we'll start to see some moisture falling in those uh, winter wheat areas that have been pretty dry the last couple of years. We'll find out what he has to say about that uh, coming up at the end of our program when we take a look at our long-term weather. Right now, thank you to our sponsors of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Show, the American Simmental Association helping ranchers move their operations forward, providing pedigree knowledge with actual performance records, and now some very advanced genomics, providing predictability so that we as ranchers can make profitable decisions. Sim Genetics, profit through science. Find out more at Simmental.org. And all flex, cattle identification and record keeping should be easy, so tie your visual tag and your EID tag and the genetic data to one management number with all flex match sets. You can find out more at allflexusa.com. Well, right now, let's check in with the captain, Tim O'Byrne. He is publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine. Here's this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. In honor of Earth Day, folks, I want you to go to the Animal Agriculture Alliance website. They have a sustainability impact report that includes a little bit on animal feed there. So that will give you information that you need to know to enter into and sustain a an intelligent conversation with somebody when it comes to uh, what we need to know to be able to uh, pass along vital information to folks that don't know what we're doing here in agriculture. Animal Agriculture Alliance. And folks, I love it when you check in with us on our Friday post, uh, what's going on out there in cow country. We usually get, you know, 100 folks coming back with great video, uh, photographs, comments, questions. And uh, boy, I tell you what, this winter's sure hanging on. I'm seeing, I've seen a lot of you this last week here still calving and, you know, there are 10 foot snow banks being pushed around and piled up from the winters, um, you know, trying to keep the feed grounds open. It's just amazing. Love it when you uh, check in with us on Friday. Justin, back to you. All right. Thanks, Captain. And yeah, you know, it's always kind of fun to see everybody's response when the captain posts that out every Friday morning on Facebook. So uh, check it out for yourselves. Or hey, why don't you also tell us what you're doing on Friday when the captain asks? So be sure to check it out. Well, stay with us. Coming up after the break, we're going to get into our featured topic here today as we talk on some of the legal issues and things in regards to estate planning and estate management. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. You know, big cows come with big feed bills, which is why smart genetic selection can pay off in your cow herd. Did you know Simmental-influenced cows are an average 74 pounds lighter at maturity than Angus-sired counterparts, according to a recent U.S. Meat Animal Research Center study? Now, while Simmental is sized for more efficient gains, 20-year genetic trend lines also show the breed offers reliable calving ease, early growth, and cow longevity. That's a balanced herd built for profit. Sim Genetics, giving you more per head, period. Stand strong, Simmental. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we head now to our featured interview here today on a topic that really um, is probably one of the bigger issues for ranching families. If you had to pick the top three for a lot of ranching families, uh, agriculture families out there, uh, farming included, boy, I I think you're going to say estate planning is going to be in the top three if it's not probably number one or number two. And uh, when we look at that in terms of how they need to be formulated, whether they plan to pass it on to the next generation or uh, migrate out various things, structure and uh, protection for liability reasons and just a lot of different elements go into this. And so uh, before we start, I, I do want to be very clear that, you know, our, our show today is not by any means intended to be your legal counsel or your legal advice. It's purely designed and provided as explanation and provide considerations as you are working through your estate planning purposes and with 
with any time, any legal matter that we talk about, it's very important that you seek your own counsel on that. And so with that in mind, we're going to turn to our guest here today, attorney Dal Houston, who is with the firm of Benson and Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma. That's just Northwest of Oklahoma city. Not only is he an attorney, but he's also a rancher as well. And so it's good to have him with us here today. Dal, thanks for joining us here on the working ranch radio show. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation. Now, I, I think uh, when we start here today, because we, we really do, I as you and I were visiting before we went on air here, there's really a lot of topics that we can get into, and I hope we can get as, enough stuff covered here today. And if we can't, I'm more than willing to do a part two of, of some of this, and we can get to some of these other topics. Part of the reason that we're addressing this topic here today is, is the fact that it is big to our ranches and our families just in terms of a lot of different elements that are involved in that. From your standpoint, when you see ranchers coming into your office, what is one of the biggest issues that you're having to address from an estate standpoint? Normally speaking, probably the biggest issue is to figure out how to hand over the operation to the next generation. And a lot of my clients will have maybe a son or sons or a child who's interested in taking over the operation and other children who have no interest in the operation. But at the same token, that rancher, farmer, that that client is wanting to be fair to the other children and at the same time fair to the child or children who is taking over the operation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. So... As a general rule, that is one of the big things we encounter in our estate planning practice. The second would be is if we've got a situation where maybe no one's wanting to take over the operation and and, and what do we want to do with that land? How do we want to hold that land? Do we want to leave it in trust for our children? Or do we want to distribute it to them so that so that as soon as that person dies, that land becomes their children's land and now they can do whatever they want with it, whether it means selling it, potentially losing it, uh, mortgaging it, giving it away, doing whatever. So uh, out of those mm-hmm. two topics, that would probably consume 80 percent of what my clients are concerned about. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think that makes sense. I think you nailed exactly what are the, <laughs> just in my mind is, as I asked that question, I thought, well, here's what I've had to deal with from a personal standpoint. And you kind of nailed both of those. So now that we've identified the issue, <laughs> for lack of better words, or the issues, let's start to flush out some of the tools or, or the things that uh, can be used to handle estate planning. And I know a lot of these terminologies for, for a lot of us, we've probably heard them, but as as, as I, you and I were talking before we went on air here, was I'm not an attorney, so some of this stuff just doesn't stay at the top of my mind. Awareness of of trust, the difference between a revocable, irrevocable, uh, how that differs from a will, and all these kind of things. So let's just start with a trust and basically providing some definition to that and how that functions in regards to estate management. Okay, okay. Probably the best place to de- describe or define what a trust is is and and there's all kind of, there's all kinds of trust there's irrevocable trust there's revocable trust and what i'm going to talk about primarily when i'm talking with trust unless i specifically say irrevocable i'm talking about a revocable trust and think of it as just a last will and testament substitute a last will and testament is saying distribute my property as follows to my children x y and z or whatever Mm -hmm. and a trust that's revocable is just really a substitute for a will but what that substitution does is really important and that is a will has to be probated a will has no effect until that person who made the will dies and now that will is offered to probate and whereas a trust is likewise created while that person's alive, but it's got aspects of it that will let you carry on normally without probating the person's estate. They can have provisions in them to say, 
if I've got a farmer or a rancher who says, I want my estate to continue on, or I want my operation to continue on, I leave the property and trust for my children. And this is a trustee who's in uh, in charge after I pass away or become incapacitated. And, and my beneficiaries are entitled to the income or they shall distribute this property to them. And, and, and really, a, a trust can do a lot more than that. But it's simple. It, it, just to try to keep it simple, or at least here in the beginning, it is really just a revocable trust is just a substitute for a will. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So when you say it's a substitute for a will, and you and you maybe outlined this a little bit, but I want to make sure we answer this question for ranchers that are in, in light of, you know, a lot of, a lot of times we're talking multi-million dollar type of states. Would you suggest a trust or a will? Well, the more complex your state is and the larger your state is just by definition, you probably would be going more likely with a trust, just that it's more complex. Uh, you may have issues that come about that you want to hand, handle expeditiously. Um, well, let me give you this example. We're in Oklahoma, and at times we will have oil and gas booms going on here. And during those times, things are happening very, very quickly, and you don't have time to sit down and, and do a lot. You want to be on top of things. And so let's say that you're a landowner and uh, you're in the middle of something like that and you want to trust. So if I'm in the process of executing an oil and gas lease, theoretically, it may not be politically correct or or politely correct if you want to look at it, but, but somebody could have a trust and die at 10 o'clock in the morning and somebody could be executing on behalf of that trust and on behalf of that deceased person an oil and gas lease at 12 that noon. It just lets you continue the business without any hiccups or things that you've got to worry about. Whereas let's say that you had a will and you had ongoing business, you had the cattle in the feedlot or, or that you were removing a lot of inventory or, you know, there was always something, there was always business decisions that had to be made with third parties, banks, uh, realtors, uh, lenders, that type of stuff. Then a last will and testament for the person named in that in that document to have any power to deal with those issues has to be admitted to probate. And that by its very nature means that it had to be filed with the court. Normally it's going to have to be set for hearing with the court, which requires notice to everybody that's a family member that's listed on that document. And so you can see by, by just adding that layer or, or those layers of things that have to happen, uh, you've got decisions that need to be made in a a fairly expeditious manner. You've now created a a timeline where you you cannot make those in that kind of time period. Does that Mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. My guest today is Dal Houston. He's an attorney with the firm of Benson & Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma. Today, as we are talking estate planning and topics and issues, the tools that can be used in that. Uh, We were just learning a little bit about the trust versus a will. We've got more to cover. We're going to be talking uh, coming up in the next segment. What's the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust? We're going to be talking joint tenancy, LLCs, a lot of things that we still have to cover. So stay with us. We'll be back with more on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. Our topic here today on estate planning uh, more than likely is already creating some more questions that you might have or just you want to go back and listen to it again. So I'd encourage you to go and find our podcast site at workingranchradio.com and you can download today's show. Something else I want to point out. We did a show a couple of weeks ago on land trust. Now this is, we're not talking conservation easements. That's not what this is about. It's landtrust.com and it's a website that connects 
landowners with sportsmen looking to pay for access to your land. If you've ever maybe thought in the back of your mind, how could we create some recreational income on our ranch? A lot of times us as ranchers, we overlook what we've got, uh, the resources we have. We step out every day, we see it, we don't think anything of it. But there are people that would probably pay for that. If you want to find out how that can be tied together and a very simple way that that can be done, check LandTrust.com. Go to their website. They, they've covered a lot of the bases, things on liability. Also, really, when it comes down to it, you as the landowner stay in 100% control in this. And when I'm talking about activities, the things like, well, we already know about hunting. A lot of us are familiar with that. But fishing, RV camping, what about people just hiking on your land or mountain? biking, food foraging, farm and ranch experiences, the list goes on and on. And if you've ever thought about maybe looking at ways that you can monetize that and create a recreational enterprise on your ranch, check out landtrust.com. Give them a call. And by the way, let them know that you heard it here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Well, our topic today, again, on estate planning, my guest today is attorney Dal Houston. He is with the firm of Benson and Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma. And we are talking on a state type topic here today. As you were just hearing uh, in our first segment, uh, Dal did a good job of explaining and kind of probably, in my opinion, dead oning the topics or the, the issues that he sees from ranching families that are wanting to come in and how do they handle their estate? How do they set this estate up in terms of trying to pass it down to the next generations? Being one of the big topics that folks are coming in to the office, and I know for each and every one of us that are in ranching, uh, we're probably that just just rang a bell for a lot of us in some way, shape, or form. We talked a little bit in the first segment about a trust or a will, and Dal, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the advantages of a trust versus a will, especially when we're talking a little bit, I mean, typically our ranching estates are a little more complex than just a, a house in town sort of a thing. So when we get to that, then the topic we start hearing is, okay, we got revocable versus an irrevocable trust. So let's talk about the differences between between those two. Okay, sure. Uh, and, and it happens every day in my office that somebody will come in and say, my neighbor down the road told me I needed an irrevocable trust or, or I didn't need one or they had done a trust and it worked really good. But there is really a broad line distinction between the two types of trust. The revocable trust is really, as I said in the beginning of the interview, more of a will substitute. It is just substituting for a will, and it's trying to avoid probate. It is probably addressing estate taxes to some degree, but it's still main purpose is to say, upon my death, this is how I want my property distributed or held or whatever. An irrevocable trust, on the other hand, is a trust that takes effect at the time you do it, and it says it's irrevocable. And what you're trying to do there is transfer property and value out of your estate. Now, I'm not saying that estate taxes still don't affect farmers and ranchers, but in today's world, the estate taxes, and they go up every year, but they they started out in 2000, I believe it was 10 at mm-hmm. $10 million, and they've escalated from there. Mm-hmm. Now, before that time, estate taxes were dramatically lower than that. You could have estate taxes that kicked in, I believe, at $750,000, a million dollars. And so... It didn't take owning very much uh, farm and ranch land or or any other kind of wealth for that matter before you had an estate tax issue. And what they would do is create these irrevocable trusts that you would put property in that, if you did it right, would not be considered part of that client's estate when they passed away. And hence, its value wasn't brought into the calculations for estate tax purposes. So as a general rule today, while estate taxes are still around and and irrevocable trusts are still around, their use isn't as great today as it used to be when the state taxes were lower. And I know people like to complain about it, uh, taxes and the state taxes, but 
Boy, I, I tell you what, 10, 13 years ago, estate taxes were a lot bigger issue mm-hmm. than they are today. And I'm not saying they're still not a big issue. But again, with that with that higher exemption amount, it sure takes a lot of people out of having an issue of having estate taxes. So the main difference is if somebody's talking about trying to shift property and get property out of there in that value out of their estate, they're probably talking about an irrevocable trust. On the other hand, if they're just talking about how do I distribute the property on my death, they're talking about a revocable trust. Does that does that make sense, Justin? Yeah, it does. So real quick, I want to just make sure I got this part right, because you said now irrevo- irrevocable trust would be if, if somebody's wanting, you're going to see those used more likely in transferring property out of the estate while you're alive. So do you still see... Even though the, the the estate tax ceiling is really not a factor anymore, give me a little bit more definition of where you would see that from a ranching standpoint, um, or the need for that versus you know for you a, know one of the, one of the places that we would see it is still in estate taxes, and, and you know there's there's a lot of of large farming and ranching operations that will in fact have a state tax consequences. And so you're still going to see it in those larger operations. The other place you would probably see it is, is let's say that you wanted to be shifting your operation to a, to the next generation. And, and, and your options are, I can just deed that property to them. And now it's out of my control though. So if I deed it to my son or I've got a client that deeds that property to their son and now now the son is running the farming operations, they can potentially lose it, mismanage it, whatever. Whereas if you said, I'm, I want to transfer that over, uh, but I want to protect that property from mismanagement from credit or problems, that type of stuff, I might create an irrevocable trust. So instead of just the client giving that land to their child outright, they create an irrevocable trust with these are the trustees and and it may even be that the child's a trustee. Mm -hmm. But what you've done is you've created a break between them actually having first-hand ownership of that and just having the right to use it uh, subject to the terms of those trusts. Does mm-hmm. that make yep, sense? Yep. And I could see that that'll help some folks. All right, let's go to the next element of this. And that is, uh, let's talk on a couple issues and, and we can get to them respectively, but let's first hit uh, joint tenancy. Yeah. Joint tenancy is a really a uh, generally a very simple estate plan and a simple concept, uh, whether it be with a bank account or with a piece of land, it's the way you title the ownership of that. So I'll use a piece of land and that is I buy a piece of the land and I want to take it as a joint tenancy with my wife. So it just says from the grantor to Dal Houston and, and his wife as joint tenants. And what that does is those very words have legal meaning. So the first one of us that would die it would the property would vest in the survivor Mm -hmm. and so it it is very effective in moving property between spouses upon their death where we find it to not be in a very effective estate plan is when clients want to use that to bring it to the next generation so i've often seen you know, a, a, a wife come in whose husband is deceased or a husband whose wife is deceased and say, you know, hey, I've got three kids and I want a simple estate plan. Just put them on as joint tenants with me. And that's where we really see a lot of problems mm-hmm. uh, just because all of a sudden that is considered not just a gift for gift purposes, but you have vested ownership of that property in the, in those people that you've now listed. And again, that's not a bad thing when it's you and your wife 
or your wife and your, your husband out buying a house because they're going together normally and it's a joint effort and and you're listing both of them as co-owners and that with that rights the survivorship that vests in the survivor but now all of a sudden you're doing with this with this next generation coming up and and oftentimes it's just they're doing it for convenience sake and whereas the parent still considers that property theirs and it can lead to a a lot of problems as we're kind of talking about before the interview yeah yeah well and and i think we're going to talk more about this folks we're going to take a break here and i think one of the things uh, that dal just mentioned there you know joint tenancy has some advantages but the thing i wrote down in your comments there was if you're planning to pass this estate down this may not be joint tenancy may not be the ticket folks stay with us because we do have more topics for example we're going to be talking llc's and some topics like that 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 we i I want to talk about a little bit as well. Just a reminder too that uh, our, our program here today is not intended to be legal advice. It's really only designed to provide some explanation and some considerations for you in your estate planning. And just like in any legal matter, it's important to seek your own counsel in this. So stay with us when we come back. We're going to continue on on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today is attorney Dal Houston with the firm of Benson & Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma. And we're talking on estate planning. And if you missed the first couple of segments that we've already had in my conversations with Dal, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that, especially if estate issues or estate planning is a big topic to you as as a rancher. And I I really think, as I said earlier, if you had to list the top top three items or things that are really uh, ways on the minds of, of ranchers in terms of your estate planning and how that is all put together and managed is really a big, big thing. And we've already talked with Dal about trusts uh, versus a will and also the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. And just when we finished up in the last segment, he addressed joint tenancy. Now, Dal, I want to move on to some other things to be looking at or considerations as well, and that is uh, limited liability, LLCs, and that's something, of course, for for my own operation. That's the way we're set up, but I want you to expand a little bit on the uh, pros and cons of an LLC. Okay. You know, obviously, LLCs have been out there for quite a while, and a lot of people know they need them, but they don't fully understand them. And what I like to do is is first just say an LLC stands for a limited liability company. Okay. And so I don't want to over overburden the, the subject. But if I'm a farmer or or I'm any kind of person that that runs a business and I do not have an LLC, so I'm just operating Dow Houston. Maybe it's Dow Houston Ranch. And somebody, you know, I've got a pickup going down the road and it goes over the median and hits somebody. They can sue Dow Houston and they can sue and get a judgment if their damages are enough against everything that Dow Houston has. Okay, so if that's my pickup, my ranch, my cattle, let's say I'm an attorney, so I've got my own business in town. I've got some investments, anything that is Dow Houston can be attached and and satisfy that judgment. Whereas if I've got a limited liability company or an LLC, whatever you want to call it, that the liability that somebody can seek is limited to what is in that company. So let's just say that, that I own a ranch and my cattle operation is within the LLC. So it's got the pickups, maybe it's got the livestock, but the land is not in there. And so that pickup is now driving down the highway as a wreck. The only thing that somebody who's injured by my company or that company could get would be the assets within that company, again, which would be the pickup, potentially the cattle, whatever other assets were in there. And so we see a lot of your more risk adverse ranchers and farmers segregating their business in such a way as to limit 
the liability as best they can to really use some strategic thinking. And that would be like this. I've got a lot of, of ranchers who have their own semi. And as we were talking before the interview, that semi is a big, powerful truck driving down their highway with a load full of cattle and people driving it are tired. To me, the ranch itself has very little liability. It's just sitting there as land, uh, in a lot of cases, doing nothing except landing cattle to graze on it. Whereas that semi is going down that road hundreds of miles, depending on where you're hauling cattle to or from. And, and through cities and everything else. So strategically, a lot of clients would say, one of the first things I'm going to do is limit my liability on that semi to an LLC. And the only thing that's going to be in that LLC is that semi and maybe they got multiple semis so that that transportation wing of their operation is limited to that company and that company only. So if one of those trucks would have a wreck, the only thing they could get would be the assets of that company, which again would be the truck itself, maybe some uh, equity in the truck and that type of stuff. They might also strategically plan further. So if you've got a farmer and rancher who says, you know, I farm some, I ranch some, I've also got a semi that runs down the road. They may uh, create an LLC for their trucking operation. They may create a, a farming LLC for their farming operation because, again, probably the next biggest liability that I see uh, is running big tractors up and down the road with big, mm -hmm. wide machinery. And so all of a sudden, instead of putting the, the land in that LLC, it's the tractor. And then what the land does is they rent the land to that farming operation or to the ranching operation. So the ranch and the farmland is always protected from these more higher risk activities. Mm -hmm. that, and that makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, just a couple more questions as we have to tail out here uh, in just a bit. And I would be remiss if we did not head down this subject. And that is the cost of setting this all up. I, I don't think there's probably a ranching family that would not see the value in, in the, the the tools that are available that we've talked about here today and trusts and LLCs and various things of that nature. But at the same time, uh, there's just a real fear of moving forward on it because what is it going to cost? Uh, when we look at costs, there's definitely, a, it's a double-edged sword. You can get what you pay for. It's pretty simple to set up joint tenancies or to do transfer on death deeds uh, may not cost as much, but then there's caution there, especially when it looks, uh, when you're wanting to pass your uh, estate down to the next generation or manage, have it managed in some way, shape, or form in the future. So when we look at the cost of setting our estates up, really, I think the question is for a lot of us is, man, what is this going to cost me? That really is a big concern. Oh, I understand it is. I understand it is. And, and you know, of course, we're tied in with other professionals, just like accountants and things like that. And the only thing that I can really say to that is, yeah, I can, you know, like so many things, I can avoid some cost and say, okay, I'm going to do do the cheap estate plan and, and everything. And I, and I have clients that come in and say, you know, uh, they'll be talking to me about an estate plan and they say, well, gee, this seems pretty complex and it looks like it's going to get pretty expensive as well. You know, when my dad died, he just put all three of us kids on as, as joint tenants. And as they're going through and telling me the story, maybe it did work out, but it was just in some cases, they tell me, and then they add just that little bit of the story to say that had it just changed slightly, the wheels would have just run off of it altogether. And so it's, it, it, I think it's like anything in life. And that is, you know, if you're, you're looking at something and you say, I've got $100,000 worth the assets, then you probably look at, okay, what do I invest? What is a good rate of return to invest in those assets to protect them and to plan for them? On the other hand, if I've got a million dollars of assets, should I be willing to spend more to figure out how to protect those assets or distribute those assets on down the road? And some people, just to be honest, you know, it depends on everyone's value of a dollar. 
some of the way the people put million dollar ranches and and operations together was watching every penny and being careful with every penny on the other hand the obviously the bigger your operation the more thought and probably the more precision that needs to be put into the planning to make sure it goes on. So, you know, being personally, I obviously try to watch my money as, as best mm-hmm. as anybody. And that is a really hard question to say, how much <laughs> should I put into it and how many should I not? There's not a great answer and there's not a wrong answer, yeah. but I do know the more complex your operation is, it's just going to require to be a prudent operator and to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. You probably want to spend more time and effort with than than you would if you had a very simple operation. Yeah. Well, I can guess that the third topic, as you said, when most people come in, 80% of the people come in with two questions in in regard to passing down the estate. I'm guessing the third one is how much is it going to cost me? (laughs) That is, yes, that is normally a question. Question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Final final question here. We're going to have to kind of hustle through this. But uh, and again, you know, folks, uh, you need to seek your own legal counsel on this. We're just providing some thoughts for you, some explanation on things. But if you just kind of roughly could just outline a way that you would set up an estate, a ranching family's estate. Let's start from the top and work that down. What would that look like? You know, I've got a more or less normal go to strategy, whether this would be a trust or a will, when I'm looking with a client who has the next generation who is coming into the operation and maybe children who aren't. So let's say they've got four children and and one of them's coming into the operation and the other three are not, but yet that client is wanting to be fair to the children who are not in the operation. And normally what one of the things I recommend and that I just start with is to say, listen, what I would do is I would create, if it's a farm, for instance, I would create a farming LLC and I would put in that LLC all the farm equipment, farm pickups, that type of stuff. And I would leave the land that you own outside of that and so the land is basically a landlord mom and dad are a landlord and they lease that land to the llc then as that child starts coming into the operation they buy into that llc so every tractor thou that is purchased uh, for instance the child is also signing as a co-maker on that note. They're buying into it. They're earning equity in that LLC as time goes by, by putting their time and effort into that LLC. Then what you do is the estate plan itself says something like this. And that is upon my death or death of client, all the interest, all my interest in the LLC goes to child one. That is the child who's coming into the operation. Everything else, which would be the land, the outside investments, that type of stuff, are divided between my kids equally. What you've accomplished by that is you've still treated the children that's not in the farming operation fairly, or at least if I've attempted to treat them fairly, you've also have rewarded that child who stayed, stayed home and worked within the LLC or in the farming and ranching operation. You've let them slowly acclimate in there. And so what they are getting is that, that farming operation, the, the, the moving, the rolling stock of it, the, the, that type of stuff, but the real value for most people still is being lot is still being held in the title of those lands and things like that. You can do the very same thing if it's a ranching operation. Uh, that is kind of my go-to at place where I originally start. Now, that's not to say that that every farmer or rancher I have ultimately ends up there, but at least that is the starting point generally for talking about, here's how I, I would do it, and then there may be nuances to it that they may add this to it or take this away from it and that. But as just as a general rule of thumb, 
when I have someone come to me, that's how we start the discussion. Okay. And I think that's helpful. And, and it really the, the concept here today, folks, was really to get your mind rolling. I, I know estate issues, passing down the estate. It's got to be one or two in topics that weigh probably on the uh, the minds of those that are wanting to pass the estate down. And, and so I, I know it's a big topic here in the ranching industry. Dal, I appreciate you meeting with us here today and, and doing this. I, I know we've we've kind of scratched the surface on a few things. We could probably go deeper on some other things, but we're limited a bit here on time. And I do appreciate you joining us here today on this topic. Oh, you bet. I'm glad to help. And again, my guest today has been Dal Houston. He's an attorney with the firm of Benson and Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma, guiding us down a little bit more insight here on this topic of estate planning and estate management. Again, here today was to provide some guidance in this. By no means are is this intended to be legal advice. It's just designed to be an explanation and provide some consideration for your estate planning purposes. And you really need to consult with your own legal counsel as you move forward with all of this. But the thing in all of this that I also realize that it really is important. I realize this is a tough subject. Mainly it's tough because we think of two things, the cost of putting it all together and then the discussions that may have to happen with our families and our family estates in order for this to be set up. And when we look at that and the amount of time and the effort and energy that have been put into these estates over the years to put it all together and then for it to just crumble because we did not move forward with good planning. Well, I'll tell you what, just it's hard for me to deal with because I don't like to see our ranching families, A, split up both our relationship wise and also land wise. So when you look at this, think about uh, your heritage and what you want to leave behind. Do you want to see the broken walls of an estate just come crumbling down upon your death? Or do you want to see it transfer down to the next generation in a good way? And so think about those things. Stalling out and not doing anything is definitely not something that would probably be well advised. Again, I want to thank my guest today, Dal Houston with Benson and Houston out of Alva, Oklahoma. Now, if you have questions and you want to reach out to him, their website is BensonHouston.com. They've got a rich, long history in the state of Oklahoma, but I'm sure he'd be willing to answer a lot of questions, something we didn't even get in here to today because it's a whole other subject would be 1031s, but that's something he's pretty savvy about as well. So I appreciate him joining us here on our program today. Well, stay with us when we come back meteorologist Don Day joins us as we take a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back with more on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills as we head now in to take a look at our long-term weather. And our weather today brought to you by AllFlex. Cattle identification and record keeping should be easy. So tie your visual tags and the EID tags. And now we're talking genetic data. But you can tie all of that now to one management number with AllFlex match sets. If you want to find out more, go to their website at allflexusa.com. And joining us now is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. And Don, we we're just coming out of a week of some fairly significant weather change. It's been cooler and we're still seeing potentially uh, some cooler weather for this upcoming week. When we look ahead of that, um, as we starting to roll out of the month of April, we are seeing some cooler weather that's going to be happening, but hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, that with that low that's going to center over the Four Corners area, maybe it'll start to swing some moisture into these areas, uh, winter wheat areas like eastern Colorado and southeast Nebraska, Kansas, north Texas and Oklahoma. Yeah, I think we're finally going to see a little bit of let's call it a little bit of a flip uh, in the weather pattern over the next seven to 10 days. Now, part of that flip is going to be a colder regime for much of the lower 48 states here for a little bit longer, Um, especially in the northern plains in the west. Temperatures are going to again be more like early March than, than late April. However, 
Uh, by the middle to the end of next week, uh, maybe as early as Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, we're going to see some of the storminess out in the Pacific break off and take a path that's much different than we've seen lately. It's been all about the Pacific Northwest, the Northern Rockies, and the Northern Plains that have seen the, the heaviest moisture uh, and the coldest weather. Now, we've had some severe weather outbreaks again in parts of the South Central and uh, areas of showers in the southeast. But what we're going to see is the the cold weather get shifted more to the east, allowing more moisture to come up from the south and perhaps feed the development of some just good old-fashioned cold spring rains, some thunderstorm activity, a little bit of wet snow. For some of those areas I just mentioned, um, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, eastern Colorado, parts of uh, Wyoming and down into the panhandles, um, have a decent opportunity to get some of the best moisture in, in a long time. And I do think it's a change. It's a, it's a bit of a weather trend that it may be followed up in the weeks ahead going into early May for maybe more chances of moisture in those areas. And the focal point of the colder weather is going to be more directed to the other side of the nation, more towards the East Coast. Mm-hmm. So as we look into the end of April, first part of May, you said after we get through this coming week that we will start to see a warm up trend. But are is that are we going to be back more into then now looking at more of a thunderstorm type activity as we move into May in order for these areas to get the moisture? Yeah, you definitely want a situation to where you can get into what we would call a convective environment to where you are going to see the heavier showers and thunderstorms that that are more productive at producing rain. Now, the one issue you have in that pattern is you tend to have concentrated areas of rain uh, in pockets as opposed to maybe everybody gets into the action, although I do think the odds are pretty good that the shower and thunderstorm activity is, is going to cover a large geographic area. And that should be accompanied by temperatures that aren't going to be as cold. However, got to warn folks, um, if you're in parts of the northern western United States, we're usually not done with snow till after Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. um, so so there's still, still that opportunity that some of this is going to be in the form of snow. But I, I like what I'm seeing in terms of parts of the central and southern plains finally at least let's say having a fighting chance of getting some rain mm-hmm. uh when we look into may are you looking for it and and of course this is maybe a pretty wide net to be looking at this but as you know i kind of keep track of the fog deal and i don't have any fog events for may which concerns me in the fact that are we going to see a dry may we don't see that at the moment um, but the thing to remember about the month of May is, is that you can have long periods of boredom punctuated by uh, just a couple of days of excitement because you tend to get slower moving, larger storm systems that can cover a lot of the nation west to east as they go on through. And they do tend to be pretty productive. So you could have two or three uh, weather systems in the month of May. It's a 31 day month that can bring you average or above average average precipitation, but have some warmer and drier stretches in between. But right now we don't see a long, long long-term trend that says that May is going to reverse and and go to to hot and dry in any areas at the moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Don, appreciate you joining us here today with a look at our long-term weather. Thanks for having me. And again, that was meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. You can find his website at dayweather.com. And from there, you can also find a link into his daily video podcast that he kicks out every Monday through Friday. Or you can just go straight to YouTube and you can find it there as well if you search under Don Day Weather. Our weather today brought to you by AllFlex. Cattle identification and record keeping should be easy. So you can now tie your visual tag, your EID tag, and the genetic data all to one management number by using the all flexed matched sets you can learn more at allflexusa.com well stay with us when we come back we'll put a wrap on this week's edition when we return on the working ranch radio show Well, a lot of great information on today's show as we talked on estate planning with our guest, Dal Houston. He's out of Oklahoma, did a good job of explaining it, and I felt making it a little simpler to understand. So if you want to go back and listen to it again or share it out with somebody, our podcast site is workingranchradio.com. The Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine. If you'd like to get a hold of me, my email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. I'm your host, Justin Mills, and 
And until next time, I hope to not have another buck off story. Keep your head down and your mind in the middle. So long. 